Hello, my name is Cecilia Hartzell. I'm here today to uh, chat with you about the American Civil Rights Movement. And thank you very much to the Fingal Festival of History for asking me to do the talk. Delighted to be here, delighted that uh, you dialed in to listen. But this is actually really an hour long workshop on the Civil Rights Movement. You'll all be historians today. In, in effect, historians examine and analyze primary sources to understand history, and that's pretty much what we'll do today. In terms of the booklet that you have, uh, you probably received when you registered for the talk, I wanted to introduce you to some documents that would demonstrate the fact that the movement was made up of not just the famous people you're familiar with, but people of different ages and different backgrounds, some who may paid a tremendous price for their participation in the movement. And the documents also remind us that the civil rights movement took place in the context of the Cold War, which was one of the factors that shaped federal responses to the movement. You also have a timeline that lists major occurrences of the civil rights movement. I wouldn't be the biggest fan of history by dates, but because so much went on, you need that framework. And so this reason that I always include documents with my talk is because I think they make history come alive. And I say that all the time um, because I really believe it. Um, and plus people just enjoy looking at them. It makes them feel part of it. So hopefully you'll enjoy those as well. So I'm going to discuss the progression of the civil rights movement. The interplay between the federal courts, the executive branch and all of the grassroots activity that in total between the three of them were the civil rights movement. First, I'd like to remind you of the tremendous social upheaval during the 1960s. There were assassinations of four national figures during that decade. President John F. Kennedy in 1963, Malcolm X in 1965, and Robert F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968. The Vietnam War, the Cold War, the women's movement, the civil rights movement, the Black Power movement, all took place during that decade. 100 years after the Civil War ended, the bill was coming due again on all of the egalitarian principles of the Declaration of Independence. And as President Barack Obama said at the opening of the National African American Museum in 2016, protest and love of country don't merely coexist, but inform each other. And this perfectly describes the civil rights movement because from the very beginning, protest in accordance with devotion to the principle of American freedom was central to the civil rights movement. And it's inspiring for me to talk about the civil rights movement in 2020 and hopefully it will be for you as well because it's a great reminder that America, for all the times we fall short in upholding democratic principles and obviously we do fall short, there have been many critical times in our history, the civil rights movement being one of those, when what President Abraham Lincoln referred to as the better angels of our nature carry the day. Not that it wasn't sometimes one step forward and two steps back, but nevertheless, hope overcame division and fear. And because that has happened several times in our history, it gives me hope it will happen again. This slide you're looking at here is a very familiar touchstone of the movement. It's the mall in DC during the March on Washington. But of course, the civil rights movement began, began much earlier than that. Historians argue that in terms of grassroots activity, the genesis of the movement dates back to when African-American veterans returned home from the Second World War. But it is often also dated from the Supreme Court decision, Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas in 1954. In 1954, the U.S. was still abiding by the Plessy versus Ferguson Supreme Court decision of 1896, which allowed for separate but equal facilities for African Americans, which of course included the nation's public school system. The Supreme Court ruling in the Brown case paved the way for large scale public school desegregation. The decision overturned that 1896 ruling stating that separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. It was also a victory for NAACP attorney Thurgood Marshall. The NAACP stands for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. So their attorney, the head of their legal division, 
Thurgood Marshall would later return to the Supreme Court in 1967 after being nominated by President Lyndon Johnson as the first African-American Supreme Court Justice. But back to the Brown decision, it was actually two decisions. The 1954 decision pronounced school desegregation. It didn't address though, the question of how to dismantle that system of school segregation. The arguments in Brown two the following year address the timetable for desegregation. Ultimately, Marshall and the N other NAACP attorneys decided to argue that segregation should commence promptly and be completed by 1956. But the judgment in Brown two was that desegregation should be accomplished with all deliberate speed, which guaranteed that that process would be painfully slow. With no specific parameters, the Southern states could integrate schools at their own pace, allowing them to use tactics to delay the process. However, many historians and non-historians alike believe that the Brown decision heralded a new era in American race relations and also helped to precipitate the end of Jim Crow. And I would argue that, that the decision was a spark for the 1960s movement because it accomplished two things. One, it created an, an expectation for African Americans that the integration of schools was just the beginning, that the same principle of equality would extend to the removal of racial barriers in other areas of society. And two, the Brown decision ensured that when the civil rights movement resumed after waning in the early 1950s, it would have the backing of the federal courts. The next phase of the movement yeah, is a story that everyone is familiar with and actually where Martin Luther King Jr. entered the movement on a national scale. He was 26 years old and had only recently moved to Montgomery to pastor the same Baptist church in which his father and grandfather had served as pastors. The King family had been living in Montgomery for less than a year when that city became the epicenter for the struggle of civil rights. 2nd of March, 1955, a 15 year old girl refused to give up her seat to a white man on a Montgomery city bus in violation of local law. Claudette Colvin was arrested and taken to jail. And at first, the local chapter of the NAACP felt like they had an excellent test case to challenge Montgomery's segregated bus policy. But then it was revealed that Claudette was pregnant and civil rights leaders feared it would scandalize the deeply religious black community and also make Colvin and therefore the group's efforts less credible in the eyes of potential liberal supporters in the North. So they didn't actually follow that up, but on the 1st of December 55, they got another chance to make their case. That evening, 42 year old Rosa Parks boarded the Cleveland Avenue bus to go home after an exhausting day at work. She sat in the first row of the colored section in the middle of the bus. Bus traveled its route, all the seats in the white section filled up. Several more white passengers got on and the bus driver noticed that there were several white men standing and demanded that Parks and other African-American uh, passengers on the bus give up their seats. Three other African-American passengers reluctantly did so, but Parks refused. She remained seated, she refused again, she was arrested and booked for violating the Montgomery City Code. On the night that Rosa Parks was arrested, E.D. Nixon, who was head of the local NAACP chapter, met with Martin Luther King Jr. and other local civil rights leaders to plan that citywide bus boycott. King was elected to lead the boycott for a number of reasons. Historians say that it was really because he was young, he had solid academic and professional training, he had strong family connections, obviously, and had professional standing and all of those factors along with the fact that he was new to the area and therefore had very few adversaries, convinced the local NAACP that he would have strong credibility with the black community as well. Rosa Parks arrest set off that year long bus boycott and that was the beginning of the mass participation era of the movement, that phase that everyone associates with the civil rights movement. The bus boycott lasted 381 days, and all classes of African Americans in Montgomery walked or rode in carpools to get to their destinations. Finally, in November 1956, the Supreme Court ruled segregation in public transportation was unconstitutional.
But I want to take a second and mention a couple of things about Rosa Parks. There's more to her story than what's widely enshrined in public memory. Um, she was often critical of the gradual pace of the civil rights movement during the 1940s and early 1950s. And that would be in, in conflict with that memory of her as being more meek or more accepting of the status quo until she was just too tired to do otherwise. No, she was actually had a long dynamic history of civil rights activism. And she went to her first NAACP meeting in 1943, and that's where she actually met Edie Nixon for the first time. But the bus boycott in Montgomery marked a turning point in post-war American history and in the crusade for civil rights. It launched the civil rights movement as a nonviolent crusade based out of Southern black churches. It gained the support of Northern liberals and it focused an unprecedented amount of international attention on American racial policies, which was no small feat and no small indicator in, in the Cold War era. And lastly, Martin Luther King entered the national spotlight as an inspirational proponent of nonviolent organized resistance. Practically overnight, he became the national symbol of the movement. And how did that happen? How did he capture the national imagination and the support of Northern liberals as well as, as African Americans, which again was no small feat? For one thing, he presented the case for African-American rights in a way that merged their experience with that of the nation. He used language from the Declaration of Independence to frame his arguments for African-American civic inclusion. He studied the writings of Thoreau and Gandhi on peaceful civil disobedience, and his speeches echoed those beliefs as well as Christian beliefs from the Bible, and Christian themes from the Bible. He repeatedly invoked the Bible to preach justice and forgiveness, and he appealed to white America by stressing the protesters' love of country and devotion to national values. However, despite the success of the popular mobilization of the boycott, the city of Montgomery only agreed to the demands of the bus boycott after that Supreme Court ruling. Meanwhile, there was a pushback against the Brown ruling across the South. And in terms of that pushback, the federal government was caught between a bit of a rock and a hard place. Overall, it struggled to remain aloof from that civil rights struggle and intercede really only at crisis points. One of those crisis points was about to happen. President Dwight D. Eisenhower would be forced to confront the issue of school, school desegregation in Little Rock, Arkansas. Little Rock, the capital of Arkansas. But in the 1950s, it would have had a relatively small town feel to it. The police knew everyone. They all attended the same churches. Their sons played football together and so on. So that when the white citizens began to push back against this rollout of the Brown decision, it was difficult for the police to quell those demonstrations, or maybe they chose not to quell those demonstrations that often became riots, which um, as they became increasingly violent, President Eisenhower was forced to make this decision to issue an executive order, sending federal troops down to Arkansas to force adherence to that Supreme Court decision, the Brown decision. And I've included the text from his address to the nation in your booklets because I think that explains why he made that decision. In that address, he indicated that compulsory school segregation was unconstitutional due to the Supreme Court decision and quote, that a foundation of our American way of life is our national respect for law. For Eisenhower, the issue was the structure of American democracy, the checks and the balances and the respect for the democratic process all had to function. And, and as he said, when a state seeks to frustrate the orders of a federal court, the oath of office of the president requires that he take action to give that protection. Failure to act in such a case would be tantamount to acquiescence in anarchy and the dissolution of the union. If the structure of American democracy was not demonstrably unassailable, there was no product to export, no product to hold up against the spread of communism. I think Eisenhower understood that, and that's why he saw this standoff between federal and state authority as so crucial at that point in the Cold War. 
as he said in the last line of his address to the American public, thus will be restored the image of America. So in 1957, he did send federal troops down to Arkansas to Little Rock Central High School to escort nine African-American children, the Little Rock Nine as they came to be known, into the school. Each student had a soldier posted outside of his or her classroom, and that soldier walked behind each student in the hall between classes to keep them from being hurt. When Eisenhower federalized the Arkansas National Guard and sent down the 101st Airborne, to Arkansas, that was the first time since Reconstruction following the Civil War that federal troops had been sent to the South to restore order over racial issues. So that was a pretty momentous decision on Eisenhower's part. In fact, later in his life, Eisenhower said that the two hardest decisions that he had to make as Supreme Allied Commander um, of the Allied Forces in World War II and as President of the United States were to issue the go order for the Normandy invasion and to send the 101st Airborne down to Arkansas. However, despite the events in Little Rock, because of massive resistance across the South and limited support of the federal government, the pace of the civil rights movement slowed then between 1957 and 1960. By the time John F. Kennedy took the oath of office in January 1961, fewer than 2% of black students attended the segregated schools in the former Confederate states. The sit-in phase of the movement began in 1960. February 1st, 1960, four students from North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University, this was an African-American college in Greensboro, North Carolina, they went into the local Woolworths department store and sat down at the lunch counter, which was reserved for white customers. They were refused service. They stayed there till uh, the store closed for the day, and they came back the next day and the next. As the days went on, more African American students joined them, as did some white students. And the protest went on for five months until Woolworths agreed to serve African American customers at its lunch counters. And I always think that's so amazing because one of my clearest and most cherished memories is as a little girl going with my grandmother to Woolworths for shopping or whatever she bought there and then we would have a milkshake at the lunch counter and that would probably have been say that was six or seven years after this maybe eight years after this and that was because of those brave young people who did that. Those sit-ins reflected youth frustration of that slow pace of change in the status quo on race in the states. Sit-ins had occurred before, but that Greensboro sit-in sparked similar death demonstrations across the country that demanded integration not only of lunch counters, but parks, restaurants, libraries, and other public facilities. By the end of 1960, some 70,000 demonstrators had participated in sit-ins, all relying on King's philosophy of nonviolence. And with the sit-ins, for the first time, university students became an integral part of the leading force for social change. Well, that's something that we're used to thinking has always been the case, but this is really where that started. In 1960, students at a university in North Carolina formed the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. And although they did advocate nonviolent direct action, SNCC very uh, quickly became the militant arm of the civil rights movement. Several dozen SNCC field secretaries went out into the deep south and they embedded themselves in the local communities. They worked with uh, local African Americans in those community and gang communities and gained their confidence. They enlisted the aid of local young people and they challenged racial segregation on every form, in every form on that local level. It's extremely dangerous work and it was at the cutting edge of the movement. Other forms of direct action also flowed from the sit-ins. 61, the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE, launched the Freedom Rides. Freedom Rides then consisted of integrated groups traveling by bus into the Deep South, and they were testing compliance with court orders, banning segregation on interstate buses and trains and in terminal facilities. And everyone's seen those pictures of the smoking Greyhound buses, pictures of mobs assaulting the riders, 
but the situations also really forced President Kennedy to take action to protect the Freedom Riders, despite the fact that early on in his presidency, he was hesitant to take a political gamble on civil rights, at least initially. And you have a document in your book from Freedom Rider, William Mahoney. And I think it's great to include that just to see what it was like for them because actually I, I can't imagine what it must have been like to face that, but um, it's great to read that account. President Kennedy was forced to engage twice in negotiations with Southern state governors and to send federal troops into the South to segregate the University of Mississippi and the University of Alabama, as well as to address the safety of the Freedom Riders. These were all contributing, contributing factors to his decision to address the need for federal civil rights legislation in June of 1963. Now you have to remember that all of that carry on over civil rights, the lunch counter desegregations, the Freedom Riders burned out of their Greyhound buses, Bull Connor using fire hoses against demonstrators in the streets, the riots in Mississippi, George Wallace standing in the, in the doorway of the campus registration building in Alabama saying segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. All of those images were broadcast on international television or described on the radio and they were powerful propaganda weapons that the Soviets used against the US. That maybe this whole democratic thing wasn't all it was cracked up to be. But by making racial equality a national moral imperative and addressing the nation on civil rights and sending a civil rights bill to Congress, President Kennedy was addressing America's stance in the Cold War, as well as addressing issues of equality in the United States. In the spring of 63, there was a spike in demonstrations in the South with a culmination in Birmingham, Alabama. And even for the Deep South, Birmingham was a violent city. There had been over 50 bombings of African-American homes and institutions since World War II. And remember that hadn't been that long. And members of that community had been demonstrating against segregation by local businesses for years with very little effect. So by the end of 62, King felt that the civil rights movement was, as he said, losing its window in history. The South was still segregated and he felt they needed to take a bigger risk. And his close associate, Andrew Young, said that King thought they had to be willing to give their lives to end segregation, thinking that even if they died, that sacrifice would be worth it because segregation would end. That's why he chose Birmingham, Bombingham as they referred to it, as the next front on the civil rights battle. In May, um, King made the controversial decision to ask African-American teenagers to demonstrate in the streets of Birmingham. And he spent months training them to accept nonviolence as a strategy in marching and be willing to go into Bull Connor's jails. But the abuse suffered in those jails was legendary and people were afraid to take that risk and understandably so. So King, defying a ban on, a ban on demonstrations in the city, he marched there and he was jailed himself. And during that time, he wrote his famous letter from a Birmingham jail. He didn't know if the marches would continue once he was jailed, but the young people he trained stepped up to the plate. They marched and they followed his example of nonviolence and the shocking images of the infamous police chief Bull Connor there in the corner using fire hoses and dogs on the demonstrators were broadcast on television all over the world as an example of US democracy in action in the middle of the Cold War. Ultimately, in part because of this level of unfavorable press, Birmingham officials desegregated downtown stores and restaurants. I want to stop here and say that President Kennedy and Martin Luther King had a complicated relationship. King, um, early in his presidency, Sorry, President Kennedy did not want to be seen as too eager to press for such moves as equal housing and voting protection for minorities, even though he thought that those things were inevitable. He had legislation that he needed to get through Congress, and he had to make he made that decision to not take that political gamble on civil rights initially. King was not invited to his inauguration or even to an initial meeting of civil rights figures in the Oval Office. And for his part, 
King and the other civil rights uh, leaders didn't think the Kennedy administration was doing enough in that regard. And he publicly challenged the president to do more in opinion letters to the New York Times, urging him to do more in the area of moral suasion by occasionally speaking out against segregation. And also in a proposal for action that he sent to President Kennedy on the centenary of Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation in January, 1963. But as I discuss in my talks on President Kennedy and his progression on civil rights, through events that he had to address as president, by the summer of 1963, he realized that, that the federal government no longer had that luxury of just interceding at crisis points. In June of 63, he went on television to make that speech in your booklet in which he asked for the passage of a civil rights law. He sent a civil rights bill to Congress later that month, which he unfortunately would not live to see passed. I have also in your booklets, um, a very personal document for me is an example of civil rights activism from my hometown in, in Tennessee. My mom gave it to me and you'll, even looking at it, you'll see that it's a copy of a typewritten document. And it's an example of real grassroots activity. Um, it's, um, it, it indicates guidelines for trying to desegregate um, local restaurants, uh, and a lot of a number of them are local drive-in restaurants and other facilities in Knoxville. And you'll see when you look at it that it says, you know, there is a danger at curbside. So be very careful here. If you see more than four Negroes in the establishment, then move on to the next one. And there was a list of several establishments that they thought would be amenable to this process. So it's it's just really a great example of the caution that had to be used in, in the efforts to affect change. And again, these aren't famous people. They were famous to me. I knew all those names growing up. They aren't famous though, but they're an example of the type of grassroots action that you may not see on TV. Martin Luther King though, decided that a march on Washington was necessary rather than keeping it a black Southern movement. And he was influenced in that regard by A. Philip Randolph. The March on Washington in 63 wasn't the first one planned. See down at the bottom here of the screen, the first was the March on Washington Movement in 1942, which had been organized by A. Philip Randolph, who was the head of the uh, Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters Union. The porters worked on the Pullman Railroad sleeping cars. So Randolph had been involved in the civil rights struggle since, since then, and he was really the grand old man of the movement. His opinion meant something to King and to the other leaders of the, of the organizations and um, his experience was invaluable. So on the 2nd of July, leaders of the six major civil rights organizations met to determine whether or not to go ahead with plans for a march. A. Philip Randolph, head of the Negro American Labor Council, Whitney Young, head of the Urban League, Roy Wilkins, executive director of the NAACP, John Lewis, uh, head of the Students Nonviolent non -violent Coordinating Committee, who's head of SNCC, um, and he was a venerable congressman who recently passed away this year, another terrible loss in 2020, James Farmer, Congress of Racial Equality, and Martin Luther King Jr. there, head of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Randolph thought that it might be necessary to push Kennedy to act on civil rights the same way he'd pushed President Roosevelt in 42. He wanted the march to be concerned with jobs for African Americans and King wanted it to focus on freedom and support of the passage of Kennedy's civil rights legislation. They set the date for the 28th of August for the March of Jobs and Freedom. Now a successful march on Washington was also really crucial for the Kennedy administration. In the beginning, President Kennedy was reluctant to support the march. In fact, on the 22nd of June, 63, he asked the leaders of the march to the White House. And at that meeting, apparently, he did everything in his power but asked them not to march to persuade them to call it off. By the way, that happy photo on the slide is after the march. His civil rights leg legislation that he'd called for in June wasn't even in committee yet. So it was essential there not be any violence at that march. 
but it was hard to guarantee that at a demonstration of that size. So another three weeks went by before he um, formally gave his blessings to the march. But he framed the march with the press in a particular manner, saying it wasn't a march on the Capitol, but a peaceful, um, a peaceful assembly calling for the redress of grievances. Ultimately, there were also a few other concessions on the parameters of the march that he asked for in return for his support. First, the marchers were originally supposed to march on the Capitol building where the Congress is seated. The president asked that, that the location be changed to the organizer's alternate location, which was the Lincoln Memorial on the Memorial Mall. It's difficult at this point to imagine it could, that could have occurred anywhere else. But um, as you probably know, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation during the Civil War, which freed America's slaves. That's a complicated equation there, but that's generally what we say. <laughs> He's known in America as the Great Emancipator, which I believe is similar to what Daniel O'Connell is known as in Ireland. Um, he's going to as the liberator here. In any event, the Lincoln Memorial was a fitting venue. Secondly, the march had to take place over the course of a day, with all of the marchers out of DC by nightfall. Kennedy, as I mentioned, was very concerned about the prospect of violence and in fact, to put federal troops in reserve just in case. He was taking a political gamble, but by coming out ahead of time in favor of the march, he wanted to make sure that its target was the Southern senators opposing his civil rights bill. The 28th of August, 1963, 250,000 Americans converged on DC for the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Over about eight weeks, the march was organized and funded by a coalition of civil rights groups, um, also in, included labor and church organizations as well, with A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin at the organizational helm. And they worked out of a small donated office in New York City, uh, they worked long days, Sundays were staff meetings, and every civil rights organization had a couple of people on that staff and involved in organizing that meeting, organizing that march. And they not only organized the logistics of the march, but they were also tasked with building attendance numbers by reaching out to local communities. Harry Belafonte was tasked with reaching out to the arts community for participation. Charlton Heston, you'll see, you'll see them all across the slides, Charlton Heston, Paul Newman, Burt Lancaster, Sidney Poitier, Marlon Brando, James Garner, Steve McQueen, Tony Bennett, Lena Horne, Bob Dylan, Peter Paul and Mary, and Joan Baez were some of the biggest film and music stars involved. A chartered plane went from California to Washington and the film stars did a press conference when they arrived. Some Broadway theaters were also closed so those artists could attend the march as well. And you have that program in your booklet as well as the organizing newsletter because I wanted you to get a feeling for what went into organizing an event of that magnitude and the safety and public relations concerns that were involved as well. And when you look at those documents, you'll see the efforts to build an interracial coalition and also the sheer logistics of making sure that 200,000 people marched peacefully and without major legal or health incident in Washington, D.C. in August, which at that time of year is at a minimum 32 degrees, aside from the heat index. It was the largest public demonstration in the nation's history up until that time. And in addition to its size, it was famous for King's I Have a Dream speech, which I put in your booklet. In any event, there was a lot riding on the speech that day. Given the high profile venue, King's speech really had to, and absolutely did, further the kind of broad coalition that the movement felt was necessary to convince Congress to act on Kennedy's civil rights legislation. The order maintained by the marchers only added to that. And when I first gave this talk in, in Dublin in the libraries, um, I was asked a question regarding a story I'm about to tell you. And that question reminded me that sometimes I get so caught up in, in telling people about history that I, I forget to, to tell epic stories that they would really enjoy hearing. So that's one of these stories. King had certainly thought about using the dream theme in, in Washington. He apparently had been fine tuning that theme earlier in the year at mass meetings in, in Alabama and in Michigan. But he thought he wouldn't have time to use that dream language at the march. He, he'd ask his advisor to 
advisors to prepare some drafts, one of them had come up with the metaphor of a bad check, that um, America had failed to fulfill its promises of equality to black citizens and in essence, they'd written a bad check to them. He liked that, but he thought he didn't have time to use that and this dream theme in the speech in the time that was allotted to him to speak. Plus his aides couldn't agree on whether the focus of the speech should be on jobs or on housing discrimination. And in any event, he spent a long night the night before the march writing it. And there's a long afternoon of, of, pro, of songs and speeches at the Lincoln Memorial. He had the last uh, speaking, speaking thought, Dr. King, not just because he was an impossible act to follow, because some of the other speakers thought they might get better coverage if they spoke earlier. As it's hard to imagine now, but back at that time, um, TV news stations or TV crews would have to leave a location where they'd been filming early enough to get their, their um, feeds and back to uh, their film, rather, speaking 21st century, 21st century language on 20th century topic, their film back to the station in time to process it for the six o'clock evening news. It's different now, but that was the process in the mid to the late 20th century. And as the program went on, people packed up and they started to walk away and they'd been there all day. People, some people have been on buses and trains for hours and for days just to get to Washington. They were tired and ready to head home. Then A. Philip Randolph introduced Mahalia Jackson. She's a gospel singer and she sang two spirituals. I've been buked and I've been scorned and how I got over. King was seated nearby and you can see him there at the very corner and um, you're looking at her down from her right, uh, her right arm there in the very corner. He was sitting nearby and he was clapping his hands on his knees, calling out to us as he sang. And then say 20 minutes later, it was his turn to speak. So we read from his prepared text for most of his speech. And it again, relied on his usual themes, the constitution, the Bible, the declaration of independence. And he got to the end, near the end, he came to a sentence and he thought, that's not quite right. He planned to introduce his conclusion with a call to go back to our communities as members of the International Association for the Advancement of Creative Dissatisfaction. He skipped that, and I can understand it's a mouthful. Skip that, he read a few lines and then he improvised after that. Go back to Mississippi, go back to Alabama, go back to South Carolina, go back to Georgia, go back to Louisiana, go back to the slums and ghettos of our northern cities, knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. And nearby, off to one side, Mahalia Jackson shouted, tell him about the dream, Mark, tell him about the dream. And as he later explained in a New York Times interview, all of a sudden this thing came to me that I've used, I've used it many times before, that thing about I have a dream. And I just felt that I wanted to use it there. He said, I say to you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. And he was off, delivering some of the most beloved lines in American history in a speech that he never intended to give and that some of the other civil rights leaders believed no one but the marchers would ever remember. It's an amazing story. And every time I hear it, I'm reminded of that. It's just, that's the stuff of history. That's the magic of history. And also every time I hear it, I have to watch that speech on YouTube. So maybe you will too. After President Kennedy was assassinated in November, 1963, President Lyndon Johnson called on Congress to pass his civil rights legislation as a memorial to him. They passed the Civil Rights Act in 1964, which prohibited ra racial discrimination in employment, public institutions such as hospitals and privately owned public accommodations such as movie theaters, restaurants and hotels. However, the 64 law did not address a major concern of the civil rights movement and that was the right to vote in the South. While African Americans had the constitutional right to vote, they were prevented from doing so by intimidation and violence. And that summer, Freedom Summer, as it came to be known, a coalition of civil rights groups, and these are the groups that I've mentioned during the talk, CORE, SNCC, the NAACP launched a voter registration drive in Mississippi. Hundreds of white college students from the North went to Mississippi that summer. Uh, 
and in your booklets you have a fundraising document from SNCC um, about Freedom Summer. There was a backlash of violence, the usual bombings and beatings, but the worst event of Freedom Summer was the kidnapping and murder of three voter registration activists in Mississippi. Michael Schorner and Andrew Goodman were white students born in New York City. James Cheney was an African-American born in Mississippi. They were part of a group of hundreds of college kids from across the country who volunteered to work on voter registration, education, and civil rights as part of the 1964 Mississippi Summer Project. You have a copy of the Summer Project uh, brochure in your booklet, and it was dangerous work. And the Ku Klux Klan membership in Mississippi was soaring in 1964, reached more than 10,000 people. The Klan was prepared to use violence to fight the civil rights movement. And on the 24th of April that year, the group offered a demonstration of its power, staging 61 simultaneous cross burnings across the state. Over the course of the summer of 64, members of the Klan burned 20 black Mississippi churches. And on June 16th, they targeted Neshoba County's Mount Zion Baptist Church where Schlerner had spent some time working. He wasn't there that day. He'd gone to Oxford, Ohio to train a group of Freedom Summer volunteers. After we got back to Mississippi, Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney visited uh, the church. And on the drive back to Meriden, their station wagon was stopped. Um, police arrested all three of them. Cheney, who had been driving, was charged with speeding, while Schwerner and Goodman were held for investigation. Neshoba County Sheriff's Deputy Cecil Price escorted them to the Philadelphia, Mississippi jail around 4 p.m. Despite the fact that the schedule of fines for speeding was posted on the wall, Price said the three men would have to remain in jail until the Justice of the Peace arrived to process the fine. Schwerner asked to make a phone call, which was his constitutional right, but he was denied that request, and the sheriff left the jail. Sheriff Price, um, sorry, Deputy Price, uh, returned a little after 10 p.m. He collected Cheney's speeding sign, no justice of the peace present, and told the three men to get out of the county. And they were never seen alive again. Clearly that time was a delay tactic to, to gather a mob. Their bodies were ultimately recovered on the 4th of August by the FBI in an earthen dam in Mississippi. The deaths of two white students focused unprecedented attention on Mississippi and on the inability of the federal government to protect citizens who were exercising their constitutional rights. And I wanted to show you a photo of these three kids who would be in their late 70s today. Because for all the story language and ideals of the March on Washington, these kids represent the real danger and level of sacrifice that characterize the grassroots aspect of the civil rights movement. January 65, Martin Luther King launched a voting rights campaign in Selma, Alabama. In Selma, Alabama, 355 of 15,000 black residents were registered to vote. 355 of 15,000 were registered to vote. In March, he defied a ban by Governor Wallace and attempted to lead a march from Selma to the state capitol. And when the marchers reached the Pettus Bridge leading out of the city, the state police assaulted them with cattle prods, whips, and tear gas. And most of you have seen those images, as did everyone across the country and the world, because they were broadcast on television. Once again, the federal government was compelled to take action, and in no small measure because of the Cold War. President Johnson asked Congress to enact a law securing African Americans' right to vote. And they quickly passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, quickest response ever from the federal government. The Voting Rights Act of 65 allowed federal officials to register voters. And in addition, the 24th Amendment to the Constitution outlawed the poll tax, which had been a method to disenfranchise African Americans in the South. So black Southerners had finally regained the suffrage that they lost after Reconstruction when federal troops left the South in 1877. So looking back at what we've talked about to up to now, the civil rights movement's first phase then had this really clear set of objectives, right? They had some really far reaching accomplishments. 
for the federal, so, um, federal legislation and that group of coherent organizations, even though sometimes those organizations competed with one another. However, the second phase of the movement after 65 experienced a fragmentation and a period during which there were very few tangible victories, if you will. By 68, the movement was at a turning point. Right, you've had the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, and they were incredible victories. But by 68, the road was a little unclear. How to move forward? Do you move forward by building on the more conservative methods of the Civil Rights Movement, or do you embrace the more radical vision of the Black Power Movement? And in researching the Black Power Movement, historian Peniel Joseph argues for a reconsideration of it maintaining that the movement itself was more inclusive than it had been portrayed and that its roots actually stretched back to the 1930s in organized local action at the margins. In the black community's cultural and artistic institutions characterized by a belief in black self-determination. Those values then became the groundwork for the popularly understood black power movement of the late 1960s and early 1970s. In Joseph's opinion, Black power emerged alongside the civil rights movement, um, but embraced a different political radicalism. One that possessed, uh, one that promoted self-reliance, self-defense, pan-Africanism, internationalism, and cooperation among people of color around the world. But unfortunately, it also included violence and misogyny as well. And in terms of American politics during this period, after the passage of Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65, the political landscape started to fall apart amid racial, racial polarization and violence. There was a pattern then of racial crisis between 64 and 68, including the Los Angeles, Newark, and Detroit riots in the U.S., an increasing racial polarization of um, American uh, soldiers in Vietnam. So about 68, after the social and political gains of the movement, the next rung on the ladder then was economic opportunity, a path out of minimum wage labor and wider access to union jobs. Along with the recognition of those goals came an appreciation for African and correspondingly African-American culture. The idea of black power re reflected the radicalization of young civil rights activists and resulted in an explosion of racial self-assertion, which was reflected in one of its most famous slogans, Black is Beautiful. <laughs> when I saw this ad in the Guinness store, on my first trip here in 2009, I, I actually couldn't believe it. It was part of an exhibition of their advertising uh, campaigns over the years, and I just thought the wording could not be a coincidence. So I emailed the company that owns Guinness, and I asked them when they ran this campaign, in Ireland, and it turns out it was 1978. And that would have been a few years past the zenith of the Black Power Movement, but uh, clearly its slogan worked for Guinness. Did ask, um, and I was told by the company that this ad uh, campaign did not run in the US. The abandonment of the word Negro in favor of Afro-American, as well as African styles of dress and the Afro hairstyle, all signified a new sense of racial pride and a rejection, if you will, of what were considered to be white social norms and the conservative tactics of the civil rights movement. Now, in the early 60s, late 50s, no one saw the actions of desegregating lunch counters, buses and schools, and marching on Washington as conservative when they occurred, but by 68, those had become old school tactics. 1st of February, 1968, two Memphis gar uh, garbage collectors, Echo Cole and Robert Walker, were crushed to death by a malfunctioning truck. 12 days later, frustrated by the city's response to that event and, and frustrated by a long pattern of neglect and abuse of its black employees, 1,300 black men from the Memphis Department of Public Works went on strike. They demanded recognition of their union, they better safety standards and a decent wage. Right, so in line with this new direction of the civil rights movement, this focus on economics, Martin Luther King went down to Memphis twice in support of those striking workers. The last time in April of 68 when he was killed, 
civil rights activism obviously didn't end with the death of Dr. King, but his death and the onset of the 1970s led to changes in tactic and direction. So I could talk about this another hour, but I had <laughs> close to an hour to sort of show you the trajectory of the civil rights movement from conservative to black power, from concerns regarding civic inclusion to concerns regarding economic opportunity. Um, there were so many aspects of American freedom and identity at play during the civil rights movement, including freedom of speech and the right to assemble and protest. And so we're back to President Obama's sentiments that protest and love of country don't really coexist but inform each other. And as bloody and painful and triumphant as the civil rights movement was, it was the concept of American freedom and by extension equality underpinned by the principles of the American Revolution and the Declaration of Independence that made the civil rights movement possible and make every civic protest possible in the quest of those ideals. Those 55 words of Thomas Jefferson's from the Declaration of Independence that you see there have shaped a struggle for freedom in our country that obviously continues to this day. So thank you, I hope you've enjoyed it. And I hope you'll enjoy looking through the documents that I included. <laughs>